Okay, so in this lecture, I want to start moving us toward phase diagrams. And what we've come to so far is we've gone through the laws of thermodynamics and we've seen that one expression for the fundamental laws is the Gibbs free energy. And we know that when we have these, we define dependent and independent variables. And the variables that we control in the Gibbs is pressure and temperature, which makes it a very useful potential for us to use. So we're interested in this. In order to get the Gibbs free, energy, we need to have expressions for the heat capacity and the entropy. We don't need the temperature because we know the temperature is one of our, our variables there. So how do we do that? Well, we know Cp the constant pressure heat capacity is dH by dt at constant pressure. Which means that dH is equal to Cp dt. Integrating both of those from H1 to H2 from T1 to T2 gives us that delta H is the integral T1 to T2 of heat capacity, which is a function of temperature, dT. Oops. And we also know that the change in the entropy is the change in the internal heat times T at constant P. I should point out here that right now I'm, I'm thinking in terms of constant pressure. And we'll go back and we'll, we'll look at incorporating pressure. But right now, we'll just talk about the constant pressure situation equal to dH by T is equal to Cp dT by T. And you know we know this relation because when we defined the enthalpy, we said, okay, so consider a constant pressure situation. In that case, there was no work. So the enthalpy was the expression of the, the heat that flows into the system in a, in a constant pressure situation. Uh, as, and what this means is it means that we can integrate that side and that side from S1 to S2, from T1 to T2, and we get delta S is equal to the integral of T1 to T2 dP T dT over T. Uh, something worth pointing out. Uh, put in here. Note uh, your textbook. works with the heat capacities molar heat capacities, which means that everything that I'm showing you, your textbook would instead write integral T1 to T2 Cp uh, D 
dt over t. And all that means is that in your textbook, this is going to be molar. So that's going to be uh, joule Kelvin per mole. And what I wrote here without uh, using the absolute is uh, joule per Kelvin. When you're working on problems, and, and again, this is a, a, a problem that people starting in thermodynamics oftentimes get stuck on, uh, is, is recognizing that textbooks and notes and you know professors, as we talk, will move between a uh, per mole and an absolute value. So just be aware of that and don't be confused. And I, I would love to tell you that, that I promise to uh, do my best to not, but I, I know that I'm gonna slip up and uh, I will you know, interchange these every once in a while. Uh, so when you're working, make sure that you make the proper substitution. And this is uh, in the uh, appendix. Every, all the appendix are in uh, molar quantities, molar heat capacities. Uh, so if you're solving problems and you're substituting values, uh, make sure you know what you're using. So, uh, okay, there's two pictures that I think are worth looking at now. One is a picture of uh, what these energy curves will look like. So let me uh, temperature. And uh, this x-axis is going to represent H or G. Regardless, it's going to have units of joule or joule per mole, uh, depending on, on what you're working with. And the curves are going to look something like this. Have a curve like this, and that is the enthalpy as a function of temperature. And the slope of that curve is the heat capacity. And if you then take and you shift down from that by minus T. Uh, S, and that's going to give you G as a function of temperature, which is equal to H as a function of temperature minus T S, which is a function of temperature, right? Since each time that you're shifting down, you uh, have a different uh, arrow. So if you take that, then slope of this curve is simply minus s. So at any point, the instantaneous slope is minus s. And you know that because if you take the derivative of G with respect to T, H goes away, and you get minus TS. Uh, so things worth pointing out here, though, is, is that uh, here, when T equals 0 Kelvin, G is equal to H. And this is one way to express the third law of thermodynamics, which is basically saying that, oops, that as you go to zero Kelvin, the entropy is heading to zero and 
or just say it's heading to a, a constant value, right? Everything is converging and turns out it's coming to that point right there. And for us, it's, it's a really handy thing. So that's one picture I, I want you to take away. The other picture is heat capacity. So heat capacity as a function of temperature will look like this. Let me get a different color here. Look like this. So that's the shape of the curve. And all materials have this shape. Uh, so the heat capacity is basically, you know, the ability to store energy. in atomic vibration or electronic vibrations or oscillations. Uh, and that means that at T equals zero, you have no heat capacity. And because everything's stationary, right? There's no vibrations. The electrons are all in their ground state. No energy goes in. And as you start to warm the system up, it gradually increases. And then you get this linear increase and then it starts to tip over. And this point, this point in the curve where uh, you see this tip over, we call this theta D. This is called the Debye temperature. And this is the point where all, all the available mechanisms to store heat are now activated. Because at, at lower temperatures, some of those higher frequency modes, they're still not active. Above that, we say that all possible mechanisms are, are now acceptable. And this divide temperature is uh, something that people commonly use to describe the stiffness of a material or its uh, bonding strength because those materials with really high frequencies, like diamond, for example, are gonna have a, a really high divide temperature because they have, uh, well, they're brittle and they have these really strong bonds. And something with a, a lower divide temperature, like you know, lead, is going to have a low divide temperature because it's relatively easy for it to start to uh, excite these modes. So when we describe the heat capacity, a good functional form, and this is the functional form your textbook uses, something like that. And out here is very roughly linear. And in fact, even approximating it as constant is not a bad approximation. And this is probably what you've already learned in your uh, you know, MSE 201 class, right? So, oh, well, the heat capacity is blah, and you don't have a temperature dependence. Well, first order correction is to get the slope and to get the, get the a temperature dependence and treat it as linear. And, and that's not at all a bad approximation. Now, the other thing I want to point out is that whoop, this heat capacity, this is for one particular phase. So for example, if I were to, man, this screen is very sensitive today. Uh, for example, if I were to have a heat capacity 
as a function of temperature, I could have the heat capacity for ice I have the heat capacity for water. And I have the heat capacity for water vapor. And it would look like this. In these, these are extrapolated points, right? Either you take them from theory or you have some, some theoretical means. And the reason I say that is because, you know, somewhere here, for example, this would be a transition. And that would be a transition, right? If this is T melt. This is T boil, you know, and, and you might, this is, I, I drew a little tail here thinking that it is possible to uh, go above and below just a little bit and, and, and make approximate measurements, but you can't really go that far. So if you look in the table in the back of your book, they'll give you the heat capacities as a function of temperature, and they'll give you some range. And that's because these are the ranges where we know what we have. But nonetheless, this is enough to be able to give us good uh, curves. So what we've seen here is, is that uh, you know, this, is our target, uh, and we get that through a data set. And we get that also using these ther thermodynamic relationships. But note that these are just the change in the entropy and the change in the enthalpy. And that gives us the change in the Gibbs energy. But what about H, S, and G? How do we get the absolute values? Well, to get those, we need references. And by that, I mean that we have some reference point and we define that as a value, and then we can compute the change from that reference. And for that, we've decided that elements, not compounds, so for example, water doesn't count, but hydrogen does and oxygen does, but elements in, in their stable phase, liquid, solid, gas, etc., cetera, at 298K have an enthalpy of zero. The second is we decided in stable phase, at, well, I don't even need that, do I? 
I'll just say elements at t equals zero k have an entropy equal to zero. And we know that to be true. So that means that if we want to determine the enthalpy at a uh, temperature not 298, we need to integrate. For example, at uh, 373K. Well, enthalpy would then be H at 298 of O2 plus the change in the enthalpy going from 298 to 373 of O2. And we'll just, you know, we know it's a gas, but we'll call it a gas there. Well, this, by definition, is zero. And that change is the integral of Cp t dt from 298 to 373. So substituting in uh, the, and I, I chose this to be a molar quantity because I'm gonna substitute in the value from your textbook. And your textbook gives us 29.96 plus 4.18 times 10 to the minus 3 t minus 1.67 times 10 to the 5 t to the minus 2 dt. So the enthalpy is 2,239.5 joule per mole. Entropy? Well, that is S, uh, uh, S is equal to S ref plus integral T ref to 373, one over T CP DT. Uh, if we had good data, we could go all the way down to zero. But, you know, we really typically don't have good data. You can find, there are tricks that are used to get this, what's most easy, particularly for those of us that are, are just trying to get an answer for you know, looking at, for example, uh, a reaction in a furnace, we just use a reference table. And most of these reference tables, for example, your textbook, gives us the entropy at 298. So this would be 298. And your textbook gives this as being 205.1 joule per Kelvin mole and gives this as the integral from 298 to 373 of 1 over T of, so let's just nab this. that huh. 
suddenly I feel like technology is useful. Okay, so this is that, which gives us S is equal to 205.1 plus 6.699 is equal to uh, Get water, you'd have H is equal to H298, H2O, let's call this liquid phase, plus the integral 298, 373, CP, DT. And uh, in the case of water, it's not zero. And the lookup table in the back of your book gives you minus two for one. Kilojoule per mole. And you know, you substitute in and dot, 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 and you get the answer, right? You get the idea. So what else can we do with this? Well, we can look at the latent heat of a transition, right? Our, our picture here, our picture H versus temperature, we have uh, I'm just gonna, well, let me shift this a little bit here because it's gonna have to come, man. I have this instinct to asymptote toward things, don't I? Uh, well, does this. And uh, I have two enthalpies, right? I, and that's because I have two different heat capacities, right? And if I were to say, let's uh, let's define this point here as the melting temperature, I can say find uh, heat of melting at Tm plus some delta, right? So they call this some some delta Well, if I have that, this that's my latent heat, right? It's the difference in the enthalpies. So, one thing we could do, and there's lots of different approaches to, to dealing with this, but one thing we can do is we could come in and you know go to uh, let, let's let's say this is a uh, let's say this is silver. Well, if I know that this is silver. And I know that at T equals zero, silver is solid and it's an element. So that means H sol AG equals zero at T equals, uh, sorry, 
298. That t equals zero, what am I doing? Whoa. That t equals zero, sorry. That's h equals zero. There. So what I can do is I can, uh, and this is a uh, h at uh, liquid a g uh, at two ninety eight. You can find that from lookup table. All right, that's in the back of your book. So what I can do is I can compute that H sol at uh, TM plus del, and I can compute this H liquid at TM plus del, and that gives me delta H. So that would be uh, H liquid is going to be H liquid A G 298 plus the integral CP liquid dt from 298 to tm plus del. And that would give me that point. And then h of the solid is equal to h solid at 298 of ag plus integral 298 of uh, solid at D. Yeah. That's equal to zero. But nonetheless, if you have the data for these, you can totally do that. Another thing you could do Another thing you could do, and let me uh, redraw this. Let me draw it down here. And this is the more likely scenario. H versus T. And I've got a curve that does that. And a curve that does this. Okay, this is solid, this is liquid. Okay, another path you could take is to say, well, okay, uh, let, me, let me extend this a little bit more. liquid, if this is T melt, that is the latent heat at uh, T melt. And that's typically known, right? That's you know very common, a very common measurement. But if you have some del, you don't know that distance. That's what's unknown. So another thing you could do is you could say, okay. 
I know uh, I'm going to start there and I can uh, integrate to a point. So I could say, uh, so this red line is going to be uh, uh, H. What do I call this? I call this uh, H sol two ninety eight. Uh, Sorry, not 298. I'm going to call this H sol T melting. And then that is plus the integral T melt to T melt plus delta CP dt. And this is, uh, let's call this a red curve, why don't I? And then let's make a uh, orange curve. And the orange curve, I'll start at the same reference point. So I've got the H sol T melt. Then I've got the latent heat, which is known. Right, this is something you can look up in your uh, textbook. And then you have this integral. Integral T melt to T melt plus delta CP dt. And if I, right now that, that question mark, that unknown latent heated transition is equal to, let's do this in color here. Uh, this is called H, my orange path. That's going to be H orange minus H red. So I get H sol TM plus L TM plus integral TM TM plus del CP DT minus, oops, didn't change colors, minus. Uh, H sol TM minus integral TM TM plus delta CP. This is sol. I should point out that this is a liquid. DT. And when you take that difference, these cancel each other out, which means that your unknown is equal to the latent heat at the melting temperature plus the integral of this orange path minus the integral of the red path. Right, so you're basically just following these curves using the heat capacity to move up and down them, and then using different reference points, whether those reference points are coming from uh, your textbook or the reference points are coming from you know, what you know, the latent heats, you can move between the curves. Okay, let's take another example that's, I think, a little more realistic even. Let's think about uh, the 
heat of reaction at a particular temperature, right? And that, that's also something you can do with these curves. For example, consider a, water forming, right? H2 plus one half O2. Let's say these are both in gas phase just for simplicity. And they react to form H2O also in gas phase. Okay. We're gonna ignore transitions here by just treating everything as, as though it's a gas reaction. So let's look at what that curve looks like. Uh, let me, uh, well, I'll draw it here, I guess. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll move to the next page, sorry. So the reagents look something like this, and this is H2 plus one half O2. And uh, say this, at P star, some special temperature. What's the enthalpy when it reacts? So you can have an endothermic or exothermic reaction. And if it's endothermic, then it absorbs energy in the process of reacting. If it's exothermic, then the reaction spontaneously uh, gives off heat, right? This is you know, the basics of ex explosives. Uh, it's also uh, important for, for example, maintaining uh, furnaces, right? Say you've got a glass furnace and you're throwing products in or you're throwing reagents in to maintain a glass batch. Well, if you throw something in and, and it's generating heat, and that's gonna change the amount of heat that you have to pump into the furnace to maintain the, uh, the temperature. You also need to know how much heat is needed to turn that solid into a liquid in order to be uh, batched. Uh, but let, let's, let's uh, I digress. Uh, now let's consider our products. And they'll look something like that. And let's say that you know this is a T star, then it's this point H, the change in heat of the reaction. So what you can do is if, let's say this is uh, two ninety eight, then you can say our reagents, oops, would be. would be H at two, let's, let's uh, H2 gas at 298 plus the integral CP T DT from two, 98 to T star, whatever that special temperature is, plus H, oh, plus, uh, sorry. <laughs> Let me rewrite that. Let's say that is 
H of H2 at 298 gas plus H of O2 at 298 gas plus the, and this is uh, H2 plus the integral 298 T star CP O2 T dt. Okay, so the reagents, this blue curve, you start at 298, and we just pick that because we know those are zero. So that's the enthalpy of hydrogen gas at 298. This is the enthalpy of oxygen gas at 298, both zero. And then you integrate the hydrogen gas from 298 to T star. And you do the same thing for the oxygen. Worth noting here that oxygen is one half. So we need to put a one half there as well, right? You want to keep the mass balance. And that gives us the green curve. Now our blue curve, our product would be H of H2O in gas phase at 298 plus the integral of uh, from 298 to T star CP of H2O gas as a function of temperature dT. So then, heat of the reaction would be, well, I guess it would be uh, H of the product minus H of the reagents. And this is something that uh, if you have your data for say your heat capacities, you could easily make a little script and or Microsoft Excel and you can make HRXN as a function of T star and that would be H product, make that as also as a function of T star. But I'm hoping you can see how this is useful, right? Because again, the picture that I want you to get out of this is this, this is the picture. You've got the enthalpies, you've got the free energies, you can get the entropies. And for all of these, you know, I'm not showing how to get the entropies, but it's relatively simple, right? It's exactly the same thing. You're just tracing along curves. So one more example that's gonna be a little more complicated. And in this example, I want to talk about uh, lead. And this is going to be, uh, let's say, say it's a liquid lead plus one half O2 in gas phase forming lead oxide in solid phase. So you've got some liquid lead, and that liquid lead you are uh, bubbling oxygen through and in the process creating lead oxide. Okay, so the picture is this. H, temperature, 
And I'm going to draw a liquid lead with, oops, huh, green. And I'll draw oxygen gas as O2 and then uh, my solid lead oxide blue. Okay. So, oxygen gas and liquid lead. Well, liquid lead, that's a little bit more complicated. Let's do the oxygen gas first. So the oxygen gas will look something like this. Putting the one half in there, so we'll take, you know, our heat capacity and, and uh, divide by two. Our uh, lead oxide will look, whoop, will look something like, whoop, what color I want? Blue, okay, yeah. Something like that. Our lead, though, is a little different, right? And that's because it should look something like Lead oxide looks, a uh, lead liquid will look something like that. And it, this is P, B, solid. And it doesn't cross zero, right? Because its natural state is a solid at room temperature. So what you actually should be thinking about is this. Let me draw that in a different color. Why don't I? Got all this color. I might as well use it, right? Well, I'm not drawing that very well, am I? Okay. So this represents PB liquid, sorry, solid. Yeah, I'm sorry, that should be liquid. And uh, this point, get another color here. This point latent heat. And this is T of melting. Okay, so let's let's uh, write out what we're looking at here. Uh, So the lead oxide solid solid at uh, I didn't give you a temperature, did I? Let's uh, let's say that we're holding our molten lead and bubbling the oxygen through uh, at uh, T equals. T star. It's a handy temperature, isn't it? T star. Okay. So our lead oxide is HPBO solid at 298. And that's something that can be looked up. It's, it's a common value. Plus, integral from 298 to T star CP of PBO as a function of temperature 
dt, okay, our oxygen gas, H O2 in gas form is equal to the enthalpy of O2 is a gas, 298 plus the integral, 298 to T star CP O2 T DT, and that's zero. Okay, now our green curve, H of PB and we're going to start that here uh, with the solid so that's H PB 298 solid plus the integral from 298 to T melt CP uh, PB solid DT. So that plus latent heat at T melting. plus the integral from T melting to T star CP PB liquid DT. So you see that? We're tracing a path. We're tracing a path starting at the solid lead Solid lead goes up, it transitions, and then it follows the liquid lead. And what's nice about this is that we have good data for solid lead when it's solid, in, in, you know, below the melting temperature, and we have good data for liquid lead when it's above the melting temperature, and we have good data for the latent heat and we know that this is zero because it's an element. So we have everything, which means that delta H of the reaction is equal to uh, H of uh, PBO plus whoop, minus. One half H O two minus H P B, and note I put that one half in there because we need that for stoichiometry. Did I get it right up here? Did I? Uh... <laughs> Worth pointing out, just for the sake of uh, I made I made a mistake here, sort of. Uh, should be a one half there also, but it's one half is zero. So it's not gonna really affect the outcome too much. Uh, nonetheless, you get the idea. The one half has to do with the total amount that's going in. So if you go in and substitute values, you should be able to get a uh, heat of reaction that, that matches up with literature. Uh, so, so far, so good. Let me give you uh, one last comment before we move on uh, to talking about pressure. Entropy. Exactly the same. Right? You're still going to have. So let me let me give you a bigger picture here. Uh, a bigger picture view of things will give you something like this. 
call this uh, H of liquid, H gas, G liquid, G gas. Now, we know slopes heat capacity, and here is minus the entropy. when you're transitioning at some point there, say you're, you go up, you're going up this curve and you transition and you go up that curve, you have this discontinuity, which is your latent heat. And that's the delta H of transformation or the latent heat of transformation. Well, if you think about that, what's happening down here, there is a delta G put that in a different color, sorry. But more importantly, and what I want to point out here, just in terms of what's well, not more important, but it's certainly something that's relevant for what you should be thinking about is that these slopes change. Which means there is a delta S of transformation as well. And that is equal to delta H of transformation by T the transformation. So call this T, T of transformation. So if you know where the transition occurs and you know the uh, enthalpy of transition, then that also allows you to get the delta S of transformation. And we'll, we'll be looking at some of these other more advanced curves in, in the next lecture. Okay, so let's move on now and consider when P is not constant. So P is varying and holding T is a constant. In that case, we're going to need a little bit more than the heat capacity. So the change in the enthalpy is going to be dH <clears throat> di by dP, dP holding temperature constant. And we want this, right? Well, we need that. Uh, in order to get uh, well, our enthalpy. Because once we have the enthalpy, then we can get the, uh, we can get the free energies. So we know the H is equal to T dS plus V <clears throat> dP, which allows us to write the partial of H with respect to P, constant temperature is T dS by dP, a constant temperature, plus V. Now, we're going to go back and we're going to use one of those handy dandy uh, 
Maxwell relations. And that Maxwell relation uh, we're going to use was the one ds by dp at constant t is equal to minus dv by dt at constant p, which lets us write d, <clears throat> dh by dp at constant temperature is equal to minus t dv by dt at constant p plus plus the volume. And the reason that we like this is because that expression, we know <clears throat> alpha is equal to one over v dv by dt at constant p. That is the volumetric uh, thermal coefficient of expansion. B-A-N-S-I. Can't write very fast on this thing. Uh, <clears throat> okay. So substituting that in, we have, we have dH by dP at constant T is equal to minus T alpha V plus V is equal to V one minus alpha T. So going back, so this is kind of an intermediate step here, right? because we want to take this and put it back into that. So going back, uh, dH is equal to dH by dP at constant T dP is equal to V one minus alpha T dP. Which means that we now have our expression for the change in enthalpy. Now, noteworthy that uh, for an ideal gas, alpha is equal to one over T. And what that means is that that becomes V is equal to, uh, v, sorry, V times one minus one over t, t is equal to zero, which means that delta H is independent of pressure. But real systems, this is not the case. And we can take and follow a similar track I'm not gonna show it here, but we'll get ds is equal to minus alpha v dp. So interestingly, uh, that means that for an ideal gas, we've got minus v over t dp. And because PV equals NRT, you can have V over T is equal to NR over P. So that would be NR over P 
dp. Okay, nonetheless, let's uh, go back and, and uh, summarize this. Uh, the summary is delta H is equal to the integral from temperature one to temperature two, Cp dt plus the integral P1 to P2, V1 minus alpha T dP. Delta S is equal to the integral T1 to T2, Cp T dt plus the integral minus alpha V dP. And that is the uh, punchline here. And if we take and we extend this to the ideal gas, well then you, whoop, that means alpha is equal to one over T. And, and we saw that that means that delta H is equal to zero and delta S is equal to the integral from P1 to P2 minus N R over P dP is equal to minus N R natural log of P2 over P1. That's for the uh, ideal gas. Okay, so we made good progress. And uh, next time we will look at uh, some of the uh, bigger picture relations uh, such as these.